Adesso abbiamo una, eh, una, una sessione, ancora una sessione sulla tecnologia. Eh, forse non tutti avranno notato che questa sessione allo, allo, ecco, ha esattamente lo stesso titolo di quella dell'anno scorso. L'anno scorso eravamo solo in streaming, abbiamo ripetuto esattamente lo stesso titolo, non, non è uno sbaglio. Eh, lo faremo anche l'anno prossimo, ossia eh, può l'Italia diventare un leader tecnologico? Eh, sembrerebbe una domanda strana perché eh, non si accoppia normalmente no? l'Italia al concetto di tecnologia, non la, non la riteniamo, nessuno la ritiene un leader tecnologico e questo però è un errore perché l'Italia forse non è un leader tecnologico ma è leader, le sue aziende sono spesso leader in eh, comparti, in settori, leader mondiali in moltissimi comparti e settori e anche per motivi di tecnologia. Eh, proprio la settimana scorsa noi abbiamo dato come eccellenza d'impresa, che è l'organizzazione con la quale noi gestiamo alcuni premi importanti, abbiamo dato un premio a aziende eccellenti e, e tutte le aziende che abbiamo premiato, sono quattro categorie, una si chiama innovazione tecnologica, una si chiama internazionalizzazione, un'altra sostenibilità e un'altra ancora piccole e medie aziende ad alto potenziale. Bene, tutti quelli che abbiamo premiato avevano delle caratteristiche di tecnologia, di capacità di innovazione tecnologica molto avanzata e sono aziende da 500 milioni o un miliardo di fatturato che sono cresciute e stanno crescendo ai ritmi che avete sentito un attimo fa anche per Rana e quindi eh, dobbiamo pensare che in realtà l'Italia ha delle grandi potenzialità tecnologiche, l'Italia e le sue aziende, i i suoi centri di ricerca. Allora, noi abbiamo come partner, voi sapete che abbiamo 20 partner scientifici, ogni sessione ha almeno un partner scientifico. Uno dei più importanti per noi è l'Istituto Italiano, Italiano di Tecnologia, eh, che è da, con noi fin, fin dall'inizio. Oggi abbiamo con noi il direttore scientifico Giorgio Metta, ma in un'altra sessione abbiamo anche il direttore generale Montanari e nella giuria del premio eccellenza d'impresa abbiamo il presidente eh, dell'Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia che è eh, Gabriele Galateri, presidente di Assicurazioni Generali. Quindi con l'Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia eh, c'è una consuetudine che è fondamentale perché ancora una volta questo è il tema che riteniamo tra i più importanti da perseguire. Allora questa sessione, proprio perché siamo ipertecnologici, eh, ci sono solo io e eh, tutti gli altri sono lì, no? nel, eh, quello che una volta si chiamava nell'etere, in realtà no? questo mondo virtuale che, nel quale oramai viviamo tutti quanti. Quindi se io posso vedere, ecco Giorgio Metta, buongiorno, Giorgio come stai? Buongiorno. Mi fa piacere vederti. Eh, grazie per essere qui, eh, questa sessione è una sessione tutta in virtuale e soprattutto è una sessione tutta in inglese perché abbiamo uno degli ospiti che eh, giustamente parla eh, soprattutto in quella lingua anche se lavora qui in Italia e quindi si è ritenuto di fare questo. Non credo che dobbiamo preoccuparci, eh, oggi l'inglese è un po' per noi veramente una, una, una seconda lingua, eh, soprattutto per i giovani che poi viaggiano molto, che vanno a fare gli stage all'estero, addirittura i semestri e, 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 tut, e tutto quello, gli Erasmus e quello che ne consegue. Quindi Giorgio a te eh, la gestione di questa tavola rotonda e grazie per essere con noi. Grazie, grazie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, uh, I'll start by, by doing a very quick introduction to, the, to our guests today in the session. Uh, we, and also I mentioned them in the order um, I'd I'll like them to speak. The idea is to have um, first a minute uh, per, per speaker um, in order to cover broadly the topic and then um, we, we can have a bit of discussion between us. Uh, we, try, we try to see uh, what, what type of questions uh, still remain unanswered after we've spoken. Um, so the first one is going to be Alessandro Pergo is uh, the director of, um, uh, of the Department of Management Engineering. I don't know whether this is a correct translation into English. Uh, from the Milan Polytechnic. Um, I think, um, yeah, we'll start from, from Alessandro because I think it's going to be given uh, a broad view on the topic. I will continue with Ernesto, uh, a great innovator. I'm very pleased to have you here today uh, from Enel. Um, he'll be talking about open innovation, I think, but I, I'll let him speak later. Um, 
I continue with Giuseppe Zampini, Zampini the president of Ansaldo Energia, uh, again an innovator from um, in, in many different senses, but also very uh, passionate about engineering. So I think we'll have uh, very beautiful coverage of yet another topic. And then uh, also um, I'll continue with Jan Matai, uh, um, a researcher, a scientist from the Human Technopole um, and um, very well renowned scientist uh, um, also for have been uh, directing very prestigious uh, European Institute uh, institution uh, before moving to Italy and um, and then I'll be I'll be concluding uh, I guess it's time allowing because I think we need to close at, at 1 p.m sharp um, because because of the many commitments of the of our guests today so um, Alessandro, the floor is yours. Uh, please um, let us know what you think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Giorgio, and uh, good morning to everybody. First of all, let me say that this is one of the most difficult questions to answer. So first of all, thank you very much to the organizer, to Enrico Sasson, that uh, set up this session and this theme. I really spent a lot of time to squeeze my brain and gather opinions from colleagues to, to be able to give you some thoughts that could be at least reasonable, that could maybe be useful for, for you, but it was not easy at all. I have organized my 10 minute speech in two parts. First of all, the problem setting, let's say the framework and second, my personal application to our country. So first of all, uh, uh, something about the framework. So what the, what's the meaning of innovation and technological leadership? So I tried to give my definition of what we could mean by technological innovation. So at, at the highest level, I, I would say that technological innovation is the combination of some ingredients. First of all, the application of the most innovative technologies that belong to what we call in the recent years, the 4.0 paradigm. So meaning artificial intelligence, blockchain, internet of things, 5G, robotics, cloud computing, quantum computing, new production technologies such as additive manufacturing, virtual reality, augmented reality. So this type of technologies and in an, in an interconnected way. So with these technologies that are interconnected, it's not the application of just one of these technologies, it's the combination of these technologies and the interconnection between these technologies and the other typical uh, technologies, let's say the traditional, the more traditional technologies. Then the application of these technologies to address big societal and industrial challenges such as carbon neutrality, the aging of society, the silver society, the fight or better prevention against the pandemic, for instance. And this means uh, interdisciplinarity. So being able to put together various knowledge domains. And it also means uh, to be able to manage complexity. So it's not a technical expertise uh, in a narrow sense. And third, it means open innovation. So a process of innovation that is inclusive of multiple contributions coming from startups, universities, suppliers, customers, uh, a lot of players. And that uh, is able to value the innovation both inside the company, but also outside the company. So this is what I mean uh, tomorrow with the technological innovation. So being a leader, in technological innovation has many enabling factors, as you can easy, easily understand. And also the history of technological innovation in the last decades tell us. So first of all, it needs capital markets and venture capital that sustain investments in the early stage of technology-oriented startups and in general in risk investments, because this type of technological innovation is risky by definition. It means efficiency of the institutional system. So the judicial system, the openness to free competition, 
the a, a right level of taxation, especially on labor, reduction of bureaucracy. It means quality of, infra of infrastructures, mobility, but more, more than that, digital connections. It means uh, the quality of the human capital and also within quality of human capital, digital technological competencies or what we call STEM competencies. And STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And uh, finally, an industrial structure with leaders in the main sectors and supply chains. These are the key enabling factors, in my opinion, to sustain the idea of technological innovation. So to favor the diffusion of leaders in this, in this area. So finally, uh, in my, uh, let's say, uh, uh, framework, I would like to say that leadership in technological innovation has many degrees. So it's not a black, white uh, score, a zero, one score. It's not a binary concept. So this country is or is not a technological leader. It's more a nuance of gray, let's say, that can be qualified according to some dimensions. I, I, I would like to highlight, for instance, a couple of them. First of all, the distance from the frontier of innovation. So, of course, a real leader is moving in the frontier of innovation. The laggards stands very far behind, even in the adoption process. But for instance, there could be fast followers that are very close to the frontier, that are able to adopt and adapt the new technologies as soon as they are available. So there are different distances from the frontier of innovation. And the second, uh, a second dimension are the sectors and supply chains, uh, which are the playing fields of technological leadership uh, with many possible views uh, of sectors and supply chains. Uh, for instance, business to business versus business to consumer, service versus products, mature versus innovative sectors. Therefore, it's important to qualify the position of a country in this spectrum of technological leadership using, for instance, these dimensions. Okay, so this is what I would like to highlight in terms of the framework in which to uh, address uh, this topic. Second part, uh, uh, my personal application of this framework uh, to our country. So I tried to, to answer some questions. First of all, what are the main features of our country? How can we describe our country in a way that is conducive to analyzing and understanding the our degree of technological leadership. I will use the same enabling factors I mentioned before. So capital markets, our country, I think is very traditional and risk averse in this area with a very limited availability of venture capital. It's increasing, but still a laggard compared to other countries, even in Europe and even other countries that are not the UK, for instance, Spain or France. Institutional context, judiciary, bureaucracy, free markets, taxation, no comment I think is needed here. Infrastructures, let's focus on digital connections. Of course, we are catching up, but we still have many citizens, many students, many companies with insufficient bandwidth. Human capital, we get very bad scores in terms of digital competencies. And we have the worst percentage or one of the worst percentage of graduates in STEM disciplines, even though we must say that these graduates get a premium education and are appreciated worldwide, but they are a minority of the graduates in our country. And the graduates are a minor minority of the young people. And finally, the structure of the industrial system. Here we have uh, some black and white news the backbone consists of medium and small enterprises with a few big corporations, but we are still a manufacturing power horse, second in Europe, as we know, especially in some sectors, mechanical, industrial automation, pharmaceutical, fashion, food, chemical, furniture, with very strong international connections. See the data on Italian export. And we have some great opportunities in some service sectors in which we have, we could have 
a really distinctive advantage towards other countries. Think about art, tourism, even health care. And we are a country of entrepreneurs with strong roots in history. And uh, on the same time, we have uh, a bit of reluctancy to open innovation. So here, black and white uh, judgment, assessment. So how can we assess our country in terms of technological leadership, having said, uh, having said what are the, uh, our position in terms of enabling factors? I would say that we have technological, we have technological leadership, as was, was mentioned by Enrico before. Despite all the adverse uh, countrywide conditions as we have uh, uh, seen, but we have technological leadership in more mature sectors, mainly the sectors that we qualify as made in Italy, where there is even a very good adoption of new, more innovative technologies. So all the world that we have learned to call factory 4.0, fabrica 4.0, and in the B2B domain. So we have technological leadership, but here, and we are laggards in more innovative sectors, in the B2C retail domain, for instance, in the service sectors that, by the way, are the majority of uh, the gross national product in all the countries, the more developed countries. <coughs> so going to the, more to the end, what are the opportunities that could change our positioning? I think that the so-called twin transition that is at, at the heart of the European policy. So sustainable transition and digital transition could shuffle the cards and open a new window of opportunity. But remember, there are still the Italian gaps in terms of enabling factors, they are there. Therefore, a second big opportunity is the recovery and resilience plan, where a lot of funds and efforts must be dedicated, as you know, to the so-called structural reforms, exactly the judiciary, the functioning of the public administration, the fiscal system, so on and so forth, to infrastructures, to education. This is, I think, a one in a life opportunity, but with temporary resources that can be used to fuel the change. Otherwise, they are, they are, they are only a flash in the pan, un fuoco di paglia. And finally, there is a structural change in the design of many supply chains with a focus on resilience that can reshore, move back to Europe and also to Italy, critical portions of supply chains. And so what could be a realistic strategy for Italy in this picture? I suggest that this strategy should be built on a couple of premises and two pillars, premises. First of all, we need to be realistic self-aware of our points of strength and our many points of weakness. We are leaders, but in some more traditional and mature sectors. Second, to build the role of leadership in a new technology takes 10 years, not two years. Clear determination, huge investments, concentration, critical mass. So finally, the two pillars. We should define, in my opinion, the few areas where we can play a role of technological leader. And these, in my opinion, are where we already have a strong recognized position, mechanical engineering, industrial automation, food machinery, packaging products, and maybe one or two clearly chosen new technologies, be it robotics, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, or new domains, healthcare, smart mobility, where run a 10-year competition, but one or two. Then second, accepting to be a fast follower in all the other sectors which means favor in all possible ways the application and adaptation of new innovative technologies for business model innovation. And this is even more important in the service industries where we have some competitive advantages coming from our history, our tradition, or opportunities coming from our demographic, the demographics, for instance, service or the silver age, healthcare, social services, biodiversity, food experiences. Okay, but, uh, we have to work a lot here in order to, uh, to close the gap. It is the idea that innovation is not only and not mainly based on the invented here principle, so invented in Italy, but has to do with the fast and wide application of technologies. That's why, in my opinion, the most successful innovation policies of this country in recent year has been the Industry 4.0 package. Summary, 
I, gave, I tried to provide a framework for addressing uh, the initial question and my opinion about the application. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> that the other speakers uh, will have their personal view on the recipe for technological innovation. But after all, in this country, siamo tutti allenatori, so we are all team managers. So I think that uh, you will hear any other, a lot of other possible recipes. This was mine. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and floor back uh, to the chairman. Thank you, thank you. I move uh, very quickly to Ernesto because, uh, yeah, we, we, we're going to have to be on time uh, today, uh, especially because it started late already. So Ernesto, um, let us hear your opinion on the topic. First of all, hello, ciao, Giorgio. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, my answer is yes and no. <laughs> I was a consultant, so I'm used to say yes and no. Why yes and why not? We are already uh, a leader in some uh, technology sectors. If I consider that in the technology of producing ravioli, we are definitely the best in the world. Uh, we should remember that technology the etymology of technology is techne, arts, and logia, discourse about arts. So producing ravioli is a technology too. And we are the leader in the world. As uh, before uh, Rana said, and unfortunately he made me hungry <laughs> talking about ravioli. I think that you have experienced the same experience of mine. And we are leaders uh, in uh, several technologies. If I consider that we have won yesterday the tender getting more than 110 million of euros from the European Union and the only uh, uh, to build up a new factory in Catania, in the southern part of Italy, uh, to produce photovoltaic panels because we have the most advanced technology in the world to produce photovoltaic panels and uh, we reached the record uh, for the, 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 the highest efficiency of a cell in the world. And we reached such a record several times. But on the other side, I think that we will never be a tech leader because no, there is not any chance for any country to become a tech leader. We are in an interconnected world. So, ecosystems of several countries and several companies can become leaders. But there is no chance, from my point of view, for any country to become a real leader. We should be open, transparent, interconnected, creating ecosystems with a bunch of countries and companies trying to achieve a temporary leadership. Unfortunately, I, I love always to quote Paul Valéry, he said that the trouble with our times is that the future is not what it used to be. The future is not what it used to be. In the past, we could have a leader, a country, a company. It remained a leader for years. We beat the record of the photovoltaic cell. And after 10 days, another research group beaten our record. And after 35, 30 second days, we beat them. It's just a temporary leadership. We are talking about days, not about months, not about years. If I think about a recent experience of Italy, we asked people to print millions of passes just to go outside home and get shopping at the supermarket. Millions of printed passes. I went outside and I found a policeman in front of my supermarket asking me, why are you going to this supermarket? Okay, because I need to buy food. Please give me a printed pass. I provide this policeman with a printed pass. I made shopping outside. I left the supermarket and I went to my car just to go back home. And I found a police girl, a police woman, asking me another one, obviously, asking me for another printed pass. And I say, hey, have you already stored my previous printed pass? No. We collect them, but you, you should have two, three, four going outside, because otherwise uh, we can't 
check what you are doing. And I was definitely surprised because COVID happened in February. It was clear in, on February 2020, okay? More or less two years. And we have not developed any app to monitor people instead of asking people to print passes. And it, it, it can happen that in the, in the coming winter, we will have other printed passes. What's a waste of paper? What's a, how, how many emissions of CO2 we have wasted? Uh, to be honest, uh, when I got COVID on October 2020, I asked my doctor from the hospital to monitor me with a, a pulse oximeter connected with the, the, the mobile phone of the doctor. And she was laughing in front of me. She told me that she hadn't any kind of app to monitor the patients being at home. In three weeks, three weeks, NLS developed such a platform, providing for free some hospitals for this platform. We provided just, for example, the Gemelli Hospital in Rome for free. And now, after two years, we haven't any public platform to connect hospitals with COVID patients being at home, monitoring them. Thanks to this platform, we allowed Gemelli to monitor more than two, three, four hundreds of patients. I'm not the, the updated figures. Hundreds of patients, leaving them at home, but we did it for free, just for a social need, to answer a social need, not to make business, obviously. But we made it in three weeks. How can a country that is not able to develop a unique platform to monitor patients become a tech leader? It's an illusion. So from my point of view, we should be only honest and concrete, trying to fill the gap as our minister Colau is doing now, trying to fill the gap, fill the, the digital gap instead of providing people with fiber optic access, uh, filling the digital gap in terms of culture, in terms of ignorance, because people don't use, they are not able to use the digital devices. Filling the gap in terms of uh, the digital adoption from our public administration, filling the gap in terms of culture of a digital need and a digital solution. After that, we can fill the gap. We can, my personal visit is to open up our challenges, our companies, our institutions, to collaborations with the best institutions in the world and just cooperating, not competing, saying we are the best ones. We want to become the best ones. No, being humble, being open, being passionate, being transparent, being clear about our gaps trying to work to fill these gaps, cooperating. I'm going to, to end this very fast speech. We have hubs all around the world. We look for startups in Boston, in San Francisco, in Tel Aviv. We have labs in Beersheba, in Israel, in uh, uh, Haifa, in Israel, in Tel Aviv. We have labs all around the world, in Colombia, in the in United States, in Brazil, because we want to cooperate. We want to look for the best startups, the best tech people, the best minds. I end with a quote from Carlo Cattaneo. He's Italian, he was Italian. He said that I'm not part of any specific nation. I'm part of the nation of the smartest people in the world. This is the unique nation that can become a tech leader, collecting the smartest people Powering them not only with money, but with passion, with big challenges, with big purposes, we're, we're collecting them. And just to give you a concrete example, we have launched openinnovability.com where we share our challenges. We are collecting more than 500,000 people. The majority of them, the majority of them have more than a graduation. We have thousands of PhDs cooperating with us for free. They provide us with ideas, with proposals, and when we launch a challenge, we reward them with money, 
just in these cases, if they provide us with an idea, and if they, they, we choose this idea, we reward them with money. We have collected more than 3,800 ideas from more than 100 countries. Yes. Why are they doing this? Because they want to cooperate, because they want to share, because the best, the most talented people don't work for money. They work to give something of themselves to the humanity and to leave a sign for the future generations. The most talented people don't work for money. They work to give to themselves a sense of purpose. This nation, the nation of the smartest people, will be the tech leader in the world, not Italy, not any other country. Thanks. Thank you, Ernesto. Very beautiful message. Um, you know, there's uh, many colleagues um, here at IIT, when they asked about where you come from, they answer from academia. So I think, uh, you know, it, it's very similar to what you were saying, indeed, indeed. Uh, Giuseppe, I, I'd like to move uh, to you. Uh, by the way, I have to confess also that uh, you have something to do with IT. So um, just, just wanted to complete the picture because there's me, but there's also uh, our director general speaking later at the festival. And, uh, but also Giuseppe is a member of our executive uh, committee. So Giuseppe, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Giorgio, and good morning to everybody. I will be sh even shorter because I have to say the two former speakers, I share some idea, in particular, Professor Perego, just uh, he told a few things uh, I had in mind to say. Uh, let's say the frame he depicted is totally, in a, I am totally in agreement with, no doubt that we have a good company, a technological company, no doubt they have good entrepreneurs here in Italy. Let's say a friend of mine that's not Italian just uh, some time ago told me yeah, the Italian entrepreneurs are the best. In a country which a lot of lower rules with a never handy process for permitting, with the licensing and uh, Ernesto Chora can know <laughs> what I mean with the license for getting project ongoing, with very rigid unions, you are capable, you have been capable to grow and to develop technology. That I, I like this statement, and I can share, can share it even from uh, my point of view as industrial association here in general, particularly. A lot of small, medium company have a very good, interesting capability to grow in technological, uh, uh, specific technological field. And we have even some managers, entrepreneurs, very visionary. They are looking for the future in a way that a few years ago was not conceived. Uh, just, uh, I can say some of my personal experience in Ansaldo Energia. Several years ago, Ansaldo Energia was living mainly on license from other uh, big companies around the world. We changed ourselves when I decided at the time when I was CEO, managing director, that people should go by, by ourselves. We should do, go develop technology on the basis of what we learned by ourselves. Ansaldo Energia uh, became leader in patents in 2017 in our country and the one of the best in Europe, which means that when, uh, when you are open mind, uh, open innovation. And by the way, we start open innovation in 2009, working on this. When we start open innovation, open mind to the young guys, you are capable to reach a, a point that you never think before. By the way, you, you remember, Giorgio, that we are doing something together, specific with IIT, for developing new technology in the combustion chamber of the gas turbine, that's a very advanced one. So uh, let's say uh, an advisor, looking an advisor that was uh, helping or working for a foreign customer for God, who was targeting a company for Italy by, he told me, uh, he wrote to the customer, but, but, but uh, the target has shown his ability to survive in the difficult market period, thanks to a very good R&D team and focusing the, which focus on improving and upgrading the existing product platform. A thanks a strong business spirit, a high degree entrepreneurship. 
So that is a confirmation, if you want, what Professor Perry was saying. There is company there. Uh, we have company, a lot of companies, smaller, medium size. They are showing to be leader in the, in the sector. The point, and I'm in agreement with Ernesto, uh, that before I say perhaps say if I got well, however, the future will never go back to the, what we were being a few years ago. The innovation today is dynamic. The change is the normality of what I am seeing. The company strategy should go ahead with the technology. As I mentioned before, a digitalization on the working process is relevant and the cloud technologies are becoming the basic support even for the so-called smart works. But the way uh, Chora mentioned about a photovoltaic, I am in agreement with him. His technology developed there uh, is a very advanced one. But photovoltaic, just if I want to mention some details, back in, in 10 years, more than a little bit of 10 years ago, the cost ever per peak of watt was about 4.5 4 euros. A few years later, the Chinese, from the Chinese side, they came up to 0.6 euro per kilo per, per watt, which means that even if you have a good technologies, you are out because you are not capable to, to sell to the market. Uh, what is the future in my mind that we need to move at higher speed in the change of business model? And what before, I don't remember who said, we did uh, in, two, in 10 years, now we have to do in two years if we want to stay up at the top leadership. Therefore, we have some challenges to face. We have capability to do it. Uh, again, in the area of computational science as well in health care and related medical device, devices, we can do more and more and more than uh, we did in, in the past. So if I am looking at the company side, we will say that our country is, is a leader. But again, if I go back to what Professor Opergo say, which I share at the technology and to be a leader means to be a leader as a country means something more. And so I am a little bit surprised when I read, perhaps he was referring to this, um, uh, reading the digital, the days of the digital economic uh, uh, and the society system uh, that put the uh, put the Italy one of the third post on the third place before the end. After other, as if I remember properly, Bulgaria, uh, Greece, and uh, another another country. The first before us, I do us is Cyprus. We are around 25 place in this uh, story here. It's not nice to say that how can we become a leader if uh, these index are putting Italy as a low part. Another thing is surprising reading the DESI index uh, is uh, the human knowledge, the knowledge of the human resources we mentioned of the digitalization is very, very poor. It's one of the poorest in Europe, while the North country in Europe are the best. If in this our discussion, the digitalization, all the te enabling, enabling technology you mentioned before are becoming relevant, our culture should change. Our addressing, I mean, our institution should address in proper way these changes. We really have today a lot of activity, digital innovation lab, competence centers around Italy. But perhaps we have to, I would say, channel better these activities in a way that the people can grow up. If I have looked at uh, Bloomberg Index too, the Bloomberg Index is putting Italy uh, at 20 place over around the world. The first is became, became South Korea. Germany went move back to the second place. And the third is Swiss. You have to consider, we have to consider this. When you think to Swiss with a lot of institutions that you are aware of, uh, is becoming the third place. It means there is a Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg index is based upon several indexes. I don't want to spend that, waste your time to say, but it's going from number of the patents to the number of company, uh, technological company per habitants, uh, the density of which are developing the country. 
you see uh, that even if we have high capability, uh, good managers, uh, good leaders in some area, the perception or the index, or the metrics in which we are, a country is put is not very satisfying. So the conclusion, just to, since uh, I just I don't want to repeat what uh, the other former speakers say, uh, where are we have to move. For sure, we have to pick up, and I'm agreeing this with Perigo, uh, the best areas in which already have some technology. The mature technology we were referring to could even give more, uh, because there is a lot of activity we are forgetting to say the future of the service business, service not just a third party, service mean maintenance of the re existing equipment is a great business. It's a great requ requires a lot of knowledge because digitalization, you can make services now predicting maintenance, even in maintenance as well as in medicine, uh, that gave a lot of uh, capability to grow. You can now manage, uh, we, were, we were managing some uh, plants in the US by bringing this site just over time, overnight. So if I say, look at the business, some area in which our country can develop its capability at the best. Enel is an example, Chora mentioned before the number, just beside the large number, uh, but I would address the technology we have here. But clearly, I think, uh, Giorgio, we have to help our institution to address and to move far from the lower place in this index. The index are a metric as engineer, we have to use it, which says, okay, you are excellent in some area, but the country is still poor and still poor in this part. Therefore, in particular, I was worried, I was concerned about the, what uh, Professor Perro said say about the poorness of uh, the knowledge of digitalization for different reasons linked to that. By the way, I discovered some countries are ahead of us, a country like uh, Pakistan, India, Iran, even Serbia have a greater digitalization than our, ourselves, which means that perhaps we can become, we are leader now in some company, we can become leader of the country in some area, but the way to go is a little bit too long, uh, too long. It's a little long. It takes some time, it takes some time and some address. Every one of us has to tell the young guys and those who are looking for making R&D activities to be, agree, to be enthusiastic, to be curious. We can reach some top level, but we have to move and on the school in a different way. The school is becoming the educational point. It's becoming one of the key points for the future activities for our country. So I just changed my, my speech, uh, just picking up what has been said before, just to be short, uh, but this is coming from uh, some of uh, experience. I could say I personally experience as well as looking uh, the activities uh, that has been done even IIT, uh, where we are so kind to mention where we being there, we have big chances. We have big chances as a single. We have big chances as a company. We have big chances as, uh, I could say, a small company too. But the boundary condition that, that mentioned clearly Mr. Perro before was just so kind, say bureaucracy and said I stopped because he didn't want to go ahead. But that, in, that situation is really stopping our capability to grow. Larger champion like Enel clearly have, have uh, some capability by itself, but think to the bulk of uh, the activity in the country. We need some leaders like would be Enel, some large company which can drive a pool R&D, but we need an indication of, from the institution, a very stable, at least as indication. I am, nowadays, I am more positive for the person we have there, uh, not just to mention any ministers uh, that we know. Uh, we are more positive, but still there are some way to work around. We have to work with enthusiastic. I would say that I am it's, sometimes it's difficult to be optimistic, uh, but we have the duty to be enthusiastic. And on that, uh, 
statement, I, I stop it. Thank you. Um, I think we almost uh, reaching uh, consensus here on the fact that uh, be enthusiastic is fundamental. That uh, you know we have to think we um, optimism um, on the possibilities for the future. Um, I let now Jan uh, speak. Um, I guess uh, Jan, you may help us also bring in some. Uh, different point of view here we're all uh, mostly on the deep tech on the aspects of engineering maybe you can tell us a bit more also on the life sciences that are clearly a very important topic thank you very much Giorgio, and thank you for the invitation um i also uh, while we were talking about the connections to iit i would just remind the people in the audience that IIT was fundamental in setting up Human Technopole, and we're very grateful to them for their role in doing this. I am going to talk about life sciences, biomedicine, and what I'd like to do is to talk about an area, and I think this was already said by Alessandro at the beginning of the session, it's an area which is fundamentally international. There is no such thing as a world leader in biomedicine. Um, there are technologies which are essential. There are technologies where countries have to be uh, active. There are, te there are technologies which countries have to be able to apply. Um, but it's, a, it's an area which moves incredibly quickly and where I want to talk about some of the areas that I see that are going to be very fast moving in the next few years. So I think one of the areas that the, 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 the buzzwords for this area are stratified medicine or personalized medicine. And let me try to explain in a, in a simple way what this means. If you look at a large crowd of people, they all look different, none of them except identical twins. None of them are identical to each other. And this lack of similarity, this difference between individual people is due to something like one part in 1,000 difference between the genetic makeup of these people. So if you think how diverse and how very different from each other we look, you can imagine that the same differences exist in the way that we react to foods, in the way that we react to drugs, in our susceptibility for particular diseases, etc. And so it, it is not satisfactory to have a single treatment for a particular disease because different people will be affected differently by these diseases. And that's the basis for the, the, the concept behind personalized medicine. And I will, I will talk a little bit about some examples of this. But to, in order to apply personalized medicine methodologies in any population, one fundamental aspect is that it's necessary to understand the genetic structure of that population. That means carrying out genetic and possibly genomic analysis. Genomic simply means obtaining the entire sequence of the DNA of an individual. In order to know what is the background of variation in genetics in the local population, in the population which you're studying and that which is getting ill. And the reason for this is very simple. You need this information in order to be able to distinguish signal in terms of genetic factors which will contribute to disease from noise, which are just happen to be genetic factors which are common in the population. And so it's very important that in order to prepare for personalized medicine, that Italy prepares by doing studies which enable a better understanding of the genetic structure of the Italian population. This is important for all different types of disease. So rare diseases, 
collectively. They are called rare diseases because very few people get each one. But collectively, rare diseases are a very important health issue for the population. Rare diseases often have simple genetic causes and they're an easy target for genetic and genomic studies, a relatively easy target. And many of the larger pharma companies are now working on rare diseases, which they ignored before because the market for any drugs they developed would have been too small. But now they think of this sector as being a collection of rare diseases, and the methods you use to study one are often relevant for all of them. A second category are complex genetic diseases. And here, for example, I give the, 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 the example that's very well known and very common of cardiovascular problems. Cardiovascular problems can be caused by environment, they can be caused by diet, they can be caused by many things. But there is also a genetic contribution to susceptibility for cardiovascular disorders. And that genetic contribution is not from a single gene. It's it's a complex contribution by the interaction of many differences, many variances between different people. Again, you need to understand the structure of the genetic population in order to study those. And a third example, which is very different, but where personalized medicine has gone the furthest, because actually it's the easiest example to study, is cancer. So individual cancers are, are all different from each other. You know that cancer is not a disease, it's thousands of different diseases. And some of them are closely related to each other, like different sorts of breast cancer. Some are much more distantly related. Cancer is a good example of personalized approaches because you can study the tumor. You don't just study the patient, you study the tumor and you see what differences have arisen during the development of the tumor. And this information, which is now collected routinely from thousands of patients in, internationally, can give you a very good indication of which treatments these people, which drug treatments these people, the people with these tumors will respond to, and which treatments will not be helpful for them. Again, I just give one simple example. The HER2 antibodies that are used for some kind of breast cancer where there is an overexpression of a particular signaling receptor. HER2 antibodies are very effective in treating that kind of breast cancer and are completely useless for all other kinds of breast cancer. It's a very good example and, and, and now a reasonably traditional example of personalized medicines in action. What is the difficulty? The difficulty is that what we generate by looking at genetic and genomic causes of diseases are vast amounts of data. And we need to have methods developed to turn this data into information. And it needs to be turned into information in a way that's simple enough that doctors who are treating patients will, treat, will accept it and will act on it. This, at the moment, is one of the main areas in the life sciences or in biomedicine where machine learning and artificial intelligence methods are being promoted and are being uh, tested and are showing success. And th these successes include um, definition of the best possible targets to treat with drugs in cancers, uh, carried out in part by people who are now working at Human Technopole. Genetics is, however, not the only area where we need to make use of artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. Many biological methods and many medical methods make use of imaging. And image analysis is a 
traditional area where computational support is very difficult to obtain. But nowadays, I give you a couple of examples. Strokes are examined using high resolution brain imaging. And the methods by which the strokes are evaluated to see where is the location of the blood clot, what kind of stroke has been suffered, are the methods of artificial intelligence. Cancer detection. Again, if I give the example of breast cancer, cancer detection often starts with an image which is made, an echograph or some other kind of image. And artificial intelligence methods are much better at defining whether a spot on these images is likely to develop into a cancer than our radiologists who traditionally screen them. So radiologists now make use of artificial intelligence methods to help them to define which patients need to be treated and which patients have harm, harmless growths. So in my view, even if, as I've said, because of the internationalism of this area, that it will be no such thing as the leader. I think Italy has to be a leader because the Italian population deserves the best possible health care. So what do I see, and I, I look at this still as an outsider, I've been in Italy now for almost three years, but I still feel myself as an outsider looking in. What do, what do we need for national success in this area? What are the strengths which exist and what are the weaknesses that I would identify? The strengths have been mentioned to some extent before. Small and medium enterprises in biotech, pharma, the ICT sector are a tremendous resource in this area because smaller companies are agile and can move quickly when they see new ideas, new markets. Open innovation is of course a secret to making this work even better. There is a good research center in biomedicine in Italy based on research hospitals, the so-called ERCs, based on institutions that are supported by various uh, charities, telethon, anti-cancer charities, etc. There is a strong research sector and there is a general willingness between industry and the, the, the fundamental, the more fundamental research area to work together towards improving treatments. So these are real strength. What do I see as weaknesses? And here I go back pro primarily to the idea of personalized medicine. The lack of a unified electronic health record system is a fundamental weakness if you want to use artificial intelligence methods to help healthcare. The difficulty that researchers have to access regional and national health databases is a fundamental difficulty to in, in enabling research to be done on real data. That doesn't mean the data should be public. The data has to be protected because it's private data, but it should be available. I can think of other weaknesses, but the, the one that no one has mentioned to date that I think is also fundamental is that it's not just the technology sector, which is international. It's technologists and technology developers. Open innovation is one way to attract these people. But if I think of Giuseppe's top list of innovative countries, Switzerland, Germany, the innovators are very, very frequently immigrants. The US, which has had a long history of technological innovation, is the country in the world which, which is most driven by immigration. Its entire research and education sector is dependent on immigration. And so we don't just have to think about acting internationally 
with national companies, we also need to think as a country about how to make ourselves attractive internationally. Italy has a fantastic standard of living. It's a very attractive country for tourism, but how can we make it even more attractive for top technology developers, top researchers to come to the country? Because that will be the next level on which we compete. And as you are all are more aware of than I, Italy has a chronic problem in losing its best and smartest developers and scientists to other countries. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, very interesting perspective. And again, uh, the um, I think the message that we um, have to attract people uh, internationally is very, very beautiful. Um, I think it's very important. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I also, because um, I don't think that otherwise, at the moment, we'll have enough um, of it of the innovators. Because we mentioned earlier that probably what we lack quite often is um, graduating in uh, STEM um, disciplines. So, so I think it relates the two things uh, connect. Um, I like to uh, since uh, in terms of time, we have very very, very few more minutes left. Um, I, I, I would like to ask a general question to, to everyone and, and so that we can conclude because, uh, I, I mean, I think we identified several elements um, of what it means to be um, a leader and uh, what maybe we have and what we're lacking. I was wondering whether we would like, or you, if, whether I can ask you, starting again from Alessandro very quickly, to comment on um, this uh, next generation EU program. Uh, that, uh, I mean, are we doing the right thing um, from what you know um, in, in terms of um, where we investing? You mentioned, for instance, earlier that the uh, infrastructure, um, the uh, Minister of Innovation is launching this big program uh, to, to create the proper infrastructure. Um, what do you think in, in general? Um, do you think we're lacking something there? Um, of course, from the best of your knowledge about, about the program. Uh, thank you very much, Giorgio. Uh, my, my point of view is that uh, we are not lacking something. Uh, I think we are doing the right uh, things, but it depends on how we do those things. And with how we do, I mean uh, how we connect those temporary resources, because they are mainly temporary resources, with a long-term project. I mentioned before the fuoco di paglia risk, meaning that uh, uh, my, uh, I, I really think that the, uh, the, the worst outcome is that we use those resources in these three, four years to pay for current uh, costs and we are not doing the right investments. For instance, talking about what is happening in the measure concerning research and education, there uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, work done by universities in order to get those resources, but it's important that they connect those resources with long-term projects that maybe they already had uh, in, uh, in mind, but they couldn't do because of the lack of uh, financial resources or uh, human resources. They have to uh, uh, use those resources to launch long-term plans. That's my point of view. Yeah, not easy. I think um, it will require a commitment from the state beyond uh, probably the Next Generation EU program. Because as we know, that finishes in 2026, but uh, later was going to happen, uh, it's a big question mark, I guess. Apart from the investment in infrastructure, I mean, that remains, uh, but then how to run, even how to run the infrastructure, <laughs> you have to consider the cost, I guess. Uh, Giuseppe, I don't know, you have a comment on uh, uh, some final thought on, the, on what we discussed today? I would just add it, something about PNRR, as, as Professor Perg was saying. The risk we see, I see today, that we are getting uh, back to, to, to have money with some project to make the project for getting the money, not to 
have the money to make projects already in the strategy of the company. That is risky supply and totally shares. Uh, because just for, for example, now everyone is going back to a lithium batteries. Is it the right choice today to the lithium battery for our country to set up a factory without thinking to the waste of the batteries? So that kind of project are something uh, that is risking to address, uh, to make jobs that uh, once the money is uh, finished, uh, the product itself is dropped down. That is risking I'm seeing, Giorgio, that uh, something is playing what Professor Perry was playing. <laughs> he didn't have to explain. I say, I, I sustain what Professor Perry in another way say. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's uh, very uh, You know that we already discussed even in IIT. Uh, yeah. Not to get something back to get money, but just because you have an idea. And the idea is to, to start to take the money from that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jan, what, what, is, what are your thoughts about, about this? Uh, do you see it as a great opportunity or... I think it, it's, it's clearly an, an, an opportunity. I think there is a, a, a big opportunity. I, I think, however, I think I, I, I completely concur with the danger. And in, 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 in actually in American English, this is called boom and bust. So basically the entire research sector in the US, the academic research sector works on a boom and bust principle. When there is money available, all of the research centers and all of the universities build new buildings and hire new staff. And when the money dries up at the next recession, when the money becomes less, they have beautiful new buildings, lots of very smart new staff, and they can do nothing because there was no strategy for how they would be funded to work once they were in the beautiful new buildings and, and with the, lots of new staff. And I think it's, it's very difficult, of course, as you said, because long-term commitments are very hard to come by. But it, 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 it really needs some thought about the strategy for making these investments so that it is not uh, as... Alessandro said, a flash in the pan, so that it has a fundamental long-term effect on improving innovation and improving productivity in all sectors. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was um, about to mention the same, the same, I didn't know it was called boom and bust, but um, I was told that this is exactly what happened, for instance, during the Obama administration, there was this increase in funding, uh, which disappeared later during the Trump administration. So that, that uh, basically created a huge problem. And the risk here, I guess, uh, I guess is exactly that one for also for us. Um, well, uh, I, I guess- if, um, if I can say it's a compound sure, risk, sure. because in the US, you know, also in the academic se sector, people can be fired. So at, at some level, this can be corrected over time. Obviously, you have to have a reason if you, if you can't continue to employ people. But I think in Europe in general, not just yeah. in Italy, but in Europe in general, once you have the people and once you have the buildings, it's very, very hard to deploy them to do something different. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree. Then, then, yeah, indeed. Um, I wonder whether this may uh, or should become the excuse from at least from the research sector to go asking for that uh, long um, expected uh, increase in the overall investment of the state in research. Uh, we know, uh, at least comparing the statistics with, with respect to other European countries, that we're not doing enough. That our investment with respect to the GDP is, is not at the level of France, not at the level of Germany. And we see the result in terms also of the uh, technological development in a sense. So um, yeah, maybe this should be <laughs> something, a message uh, that, we, that we pass to, um, the, of course, to the, the decision makers uh, that uh, this may be a good opportunity so that 
next generation EU is very good if at the same time we think what to do, what to have um, past 2026. Um, okay, if there's no any further or urgent uh, comment, I think we are sharp on time. It's 1 p.m. Um, Enrico, I don't know if you want to uh, uh, say goodbye yourself. Or yes, to our uh, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah, first of all, let me thank you very much, uh, all of you. And also, uh, also Ernesto Chora, which, which uh, is not with us anymore, lost in the cyberspace somewhere. But nevertheless, uh, he has given his great contribution, as uh, every one uh, of you, a lot of uh, ideas, a lot of suggestions. Uh, there's really good uh, uh, food for thought for the next, uh, the next period, the next month. Uh, looking forward, of course, uh, to having you again uh, next year in the next uh, edition of the Festival uh, del Futuro. Uh, you have given us really uh, many different, uh, many different uh, ideas and suggestions, uh, and uh, it's clear for every one of us now that we have uh, uh, perhaps Italy is, is in a very, in a particular moment. Uh, um, it's a really a, a moment where a, a lot of people say uh, this is the land of the, the, the next land of opportunity, perhaps in the next couple of years. I don't know if this uh, is dependent on uh, the present administration we have, which is particularly credible if you want, uh, but uh, also the next generation EU is providing resources. Uh, resources are provided also from uh, by our government. Uh, as you said, uh, of course, uh, is we have to make uh, the best out of it, and we have some structural limitations uh, as well, uh, some conjunctural some temporary ones, uh, we have to overcome all of this, but we have now this kind of opportunity, and you have made very, very, very clear that uh, we don't have uh, much time to go uh, and, uh, and to lose the, 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 next, the, the opportunities as things are moving so quickly. But there are some uh, strength, uh, strength uh, point of strength, as we have uh, uh, the, 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 the already mentioned uh, weaknesses. So thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Thank you for having been with us. Uh, and look forward, let us say, for the next edition of Festival del Futuro. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao, Giorgio. Benissimo. Allora, questa sessione è terminata e adesso tra pochissimi minuti avremo la prima sessione del Future Arena eh, e sarà qui con noi Silvia Pagliucchi tra pochi istanti. Grazie e a più tardi. Ciao a tutti.